This will be our second study in uh, Paul's letter to Philemon. And you remember we gave many names. Many names actually have been given to this postcard. It's a postcard from prison. And my title this morning is The Marks of a Christian. The Marks, the Signs of a Christian. And uh, uh, there is so much uh, said about what is a Christian in the Bible. But I would do my best to confine or to limit myself to just what is said about a Christian in Philemon. And I will do this in two studies, actually, because I have found a dozen marks or a, a, a 12 signs by which a Christian can be described. And uh, there is uh, a lot, but I, as I said, I will confine myself to Paul's letter to Philemon. So what are the marks of a Christian according to Philemon? And it is important that these characteristics or these marks or signs reveal who we are and whom we belong to. Who we are and whom we belong to. So let's plunge or let's embark ourselves in the first one. And the first one, uh, each time I will, I will show you the verse because it's all, all from the text. The first mark of a Christian is that he is a converted person. And uh, unfortunately, this has to be qualified nowadays. In the past, when we say somebody is converted, he's born again, he's a Christian, you don't need to qualify it. But the, the, Paul's letter to Philemon qualifies what we mean by somebody converted, a person who is converted. Okay, a Christian is a converted person who has received and has experienced the grace of God and peace with God. So those two things are together. In verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you can see in verse, in verse 6 that the communication of thy faith. So a Christian is a converted person who has experienced, who has received the grace of God and peace with God. We were enemies with God. We were aliens to God. But through grace, and peace, peace meaning union, reconciliation. We are now united with our liberator, with our redeemer, with our savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So a Christian is somebody who has put his trust and faith in Christ Jesus. And unfortunately, you are not reading <laughs> the, what I have in mind. But I'm trying to underline, he's a person who has put his faith and trust in Christ Jesus. So here are the words I'm underlining. As Lord and Savior. But we have to qualify that also. He's somebody who, in whom the Holy, the Holy Spirit dwells. So you see, the whole Godhead, grace from God, Peace with God, but he is indwelt also by the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 9 says, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So nobody could say or should say that he is a Christian unless the Holy Spirit dwells in him. And this is important because there is a teaching going on for many years now in some churches that to receive the Holy Spirit is a second blessing. It is a second experience. But that is not what the Word of God teaches. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, this is a key verse 
in dealing with churches where we are, they are taught that the Holy Spirit comes in, in the person's life after conversion, after regeneration, after faith, after conversion, and so on, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13 says, no. The Holy Spirit comes and dwells in the life of a believer at conversion. That's why you can say, and I can say, I'm a Christian. So a Christian, a converted person who has received grace and peace with God, he has put his trust and his faith in Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior and is indwelled by the Holy Spirit. And this is important also because there are churches where people are taught that you can have Christ as Savior but not as Lord. And just to give you a fraction, when you read only the, the book of Acts, the word Savior about the Lord Jesus Christ is mentioned twice. So if you want, Christ is called Savior twice in the book of Acts. But now, more than 90 times, he is called in the same book, Lord. And when you have the two names together, Savior and Lord, the name, the appellation Lord is always the first. So you cannot have Christ as Savior and not as Lord. The two are never separated in the Word of God. And I could even go further by saying the word Savior in the New Testament is mentioned seven times, seven times in the New Testament, in Acts twice, but in the whole New Testament, seven times Christ is called Savior, but more than 600 times in the New Testament, Christ is called the Lord. So, can you have Christ as Savior and not Lord? No, it is impossible. And that's why the two are never separated in the Word of God. So a Christian is somebody who has Christ as Lord and Savior. But please look again, verse 4, still in the same, in the same mark. So a Christian has received grace and peace. He is indwelled by the Holy Spirit. He believes in Christ as Lord and Savior. And in verse 4, I thank my God. God is a personal God to him. Not just a, a, a deity, aloof, haughty, somewhere there, without any relation with the with human race. No, the God about whom the Bible speaks is a God that is related to his creatures. He is related to his children. And that's why, as, as you continue your reading in Philemon, because of the grace of God, the peace of God, and the Holy Spirit dwelling in the life of a believer, trusting in Christ as Lord and Savior, and God being personal to him, he is given some names. And if I could just mention some of them. In verse 1, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother. Our brother. So, because of what is happening, now the identity, the identity of a Christian is that he's a brother. And in verse 2, unto beloved Apia. And the word beloved there, as I mentioned in our first study, could be also the word sister. So because of our relationship with God, God is a personal God. Now, we are related to God as children of God, but we are related also to one another as brothers and sisters. And as I said, I, I wouldn't dare to recapitulate what we said earlier in our first study. This is revolutionary. In New Testament time, only the gospel have brought this new identity that believers in the Lord Jesus Christ are brothers and sisters. And this is also a, just a side comment. It is the only letter in the whole New Testament where from the beginning addressed not only to men or to a church, but addressed also to a woman, Afia. Our beloved sister, Afia. 
You see, the Bible has revolutionized many things going on. The feminist movement and so-called people who are striving to make uh, women to be what they, what they are not or to, to uh, uh, just make them to strike and to enter in riot against the society. Bible has given already every right to women. Every right. They are equal. There is no, they, 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 they are different in their roles, in their, uh, in their behavior, and so on. But before God, they are equal. There is no, there is no discrimination before, before the Lord Jesus Christ. So to our beloved sister, Afia. So we are brothers and sisters in the Lord, in the Lord Jesus Christ. But more than that, look at verse 16, verse 16 of Philemon 1, verse 16. And this is about Onesimus. By the way, the, the, marks, the marks of a Christian I'm putting before you in two studies, it's a, they are a combination, a junction of the life of Paul, of Philemon, and Onesimus. Because these three are the three main characters in the book of Philemon. So from time to time, one mark will be more related to Paul, another mark will be related to Philemon, and another one to Onesimus. But as we proceed, hopefully all things will become uh, very clear. So in this first mark, a Christian has received grace, he has received peace with God, he believes in the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and, uh, and, and Savior, but he is indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and because of that, God is a personal God unto him, and we are brothers and sisters in the household of God. But we are more than that. And in verse 16, not, not, not now as a servant, and the word there is the word slave, because Onesimus was a running away slave, not as a slave, but above a slave, a brother beloved. That's the first mark. Of a, and it is an identity given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ himself because we have put our trust in him. Christ paid the price to set us free. My brothers and sisters, according to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6, we have been accepted in the beloved Son of God. We have been received. We have been adopted. Oh, I know Pastor dealt with adoption not long time ago. But adoption is a precious subject in the Bible. Do you know, except the Christian religion, in every other religion, adoption means nothing. In Islam, it is even forbidden. It doesn't exist for a reason I will not enter into now. But with adoption, adoption is a subject of assurance. It is a subject which removes any anxiety in the life of a believer. In Romans culture, in the Jewish culture, you can disown your own son. Your own son can be your ex-son, if we may use that expression in this case. But an adopted child will never be disowned. That's why this subject is unknown to every other culture, but it is precious to the, to the people of God. So assurance is a great, uh, adoption is a great assurance for believers, which means if the Lord has saved you from your sins, he has made of you a new creature, he will never let you go, he will never let you down, and he will never forsake you. He will never say, no, I have never knew you because of Christ's love and the fact that he died on that cross in, in order to redeem, to redeem his people. So we are converted, we have received the grace and the peace of God and so on. So that's a, a very important uh, mark in the, in, the, in the believer's life. So we are not what we used to be because now we belong to God, we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul could say that God who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So a true believer cannot lose his salvation. A true believer will be kept. A true believer will be protected. 
Does it mean we will not uh, backslid or we will not sin? Oh, of course, it is sad when a Christian sin. It is sad when a Christian backslid. But in his mercy, as our heavenly father, God will bring events and circumstances in your life that you will never be at ease in your condition. God will make you miserable. Miserable to the point that, like the prodigal son, and the only, the only thing you could do is to go back to the Father and say, Lord, I have sinned against thee and against thee alone. That's why we read Psalm 51. You could see the relationship. David, when he fell into sin, how much his heart, against thee, Lord, against thee I have sinned. And cleanse me, make me whiter than snow. That's the desire of a believer, not to take pleasure. That's why, again, we, we remind ourselves, if a Christian or a so-called Christian take pleasure into sin, or he plans to sin, and he sins uh, cold blood, then we have to say, no, you, are, you don't have that mark. That mark of being a converted person, transformed, being made a new creature by the power of the Holy Spirit through what Christ has achieved on the cross of Calvary. My brothers and sisters, we have been made new. Second Corinthians 5, 7, a classic verse, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Oh, I wish I could say more on this first mark. But the second, the second mark, of a true believer, of a Christian, confined to Philemon, is that he is a man of prayer. He is an, in an intercessor. A Christian is somebody who prays. A Christian is somebody who intercedes for other people. In verse 4, I thank my God making mention of thee always in my prayers. Please look at verse 22 also. What Paul was expecting from Philemon and the church that uh, dwelt or met in his house. In verse 22, by which all prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers, through your prayers I, sh I shall be given unto you. <laughs> Prayer is not a play. Prayer is a very serious matter. And if we are honest with ourselves, we all struggle with prayer. We all struggle with prayer. And we give, we give up so easily. So many unwanted thoughts, so many evil thoughts, so many distractions, so many, so many things just coming to our mind. When, when we were embarked and, and started to be solemn and serious about prayer, other things, other events are happening in our lives. And then the five minutes, uh, thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, see you tomorrow. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. We struggle with prayer. But it is amazing. That's why some churches do not have a prayer meeting. Because it's hard to pray. And thank God. Though God knows all things, though he knows before the thought come to your mind, before even the word is upon your tongue, before you do anything, the omniscient God knows everything before the foundation of the world. This, this should amaze you and me, actually, that though God knows everything, he still takes into account our feeble prayers. When I read Matthew chapter 6 about prayer, the Lord said, enter in your room, close your room, your father who knows all things in secret will reward you. Do you know the application we can make from that? Even before I close the door and enter into prayer, God has made the promise that he's already there. He's already there. And he will answer our prayers. Later we'll come to things which hinder, hinder our prayers. But for now, it is amazing that God knows all things, but he still takes into account our prayers. And he wants to hear from us. Like a father, like a father who wants to hear from his children. He, he may know what the children need, but he wants to see that dependence. He wants to see that affection. He wants to see that care. He wants to see that need. 
I, I'm sure no, no father would, would say, no, I don't want to listen to you. And our, this is our heavenly father. It's not like uh, the earthly fathers, brush and gentle. But our heavenly father says, come, pray. And the Lord Jesus said in John chapter 16, he said, up till now you have not asked anything. Ask, ask, seek and knock, and it shall be, it shall be given unto us. Seek and we shall find. It is good to know that we are not standing alone. My brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus Christ prays for us. We must also pray for one another. James 5 verse 16 says, pray for one another. It is a duty. Prayerlessness is a sin. A Christian who does not pray is telling God, I don't need you. I am self-sufficient. I have it all. And this is what makes the West, the, the, the Western world, because people think, but what, what do I need God for? Look, I have a nice house. Have you seen my car? Have you seen my job? I have a good employment. Uh, look, you, it's you in the third world there. The, the people are dying, starving. and so, You need God because you need something to cleave unto. That's not true. God has put that eternity in the life of each one of us. Either we are rich or poor. And actually, the poor can be as proud as the rich. Oh, we need God. Without God, no matter who we are, no matter how rich we are, our life will be empty, our life will be vanity, it will be purposeless, and it will be insignificant. Because th th this life is not what, all what there is. There is life after death. Look at even the seasons, winter, spring, autumn, and so on. Why, why they are renewed all the time? It, it is, it, even the nature is telling us that one day this world is going to be dismantled and there will be a new world. There will be a world, new heaven, new earth, where righteousness dwelleth. No sin, no tears, no death, no suffering. But Christ himself will be in the midst of his people. That's the purpose of the Christian life. That's the hope also of the Christian life. A Christian is somebody who prays. And Paul believed in prayer, not only in his own, in his own prayers, but he believed also in the prayers of other people. I could have taken you to so many texts uh, in Colossians, in Philippians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. You will see this man daily, he had a list, a prayer list. He, was, he had people daily about whom he was praying in his, uh, in, even in prison. Remember, it was in prison that he wrote the letter to the Philippians, and Philippians 4.4, 4, somebody in prison could say, rejoice always. I say rejoice in the Lord. <laughs> and I said to myself, if when, even free I don't rejoice, what about when I will be in prison? My brothers and sisters, prayer is important, is vital. It is the most important thing. And it is a duty. We must pray for one another. And we should count on the prayers of one another. Uh, some believers, they, they are, oh, you want the preacher to preach a good sermon? Have you prayed for him? Have you prayed for him? Oh, yes, we must pray for them. We must pray for them daily and weekly. Ah, Spurgeon, he said, I would rather teach one man to pray than ten men to preach. And uh, William Cooper said, prayer, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest Christian on his knees. Satan trembles when he sees the weakest Christian on his knees. There are uh, preachers who say only their prayers are important. But you see in verse 22, Paul says also, I count on your prayers. I covet your prayers. Please do pray for me. Because of your prayers, I believe that the Lord will set me free from this prison. So the, prayer of, the prayers of the preacher are not the only anointed ones. That's why there is no hierarchy in the church. The prayers of all the children of God have access to the living God. The child can pray. 
The adult alike can, play, can pray, the senior can pray, men can pray, women can pray. That's why everyone should contribute in the prayer meeting, not just those, the, those heroes or giants or, or so-called men of prayer. Everyone, young and adult alike should, and old alike, should, should be involved and contribute in the prayer meeting. It is vital to pray. Prayer does move the hand of God. Prayer does it. Oh, may God burden us to pray. To pray for ourselves, of course, to pray for others also, and especially to pray for souls. If Paul, the greatest apostle, needed to pray and others to pray for him, what about you and me? Of course, I need your prayers. You need my prayers. We must intercede for one another. Even the Lord Jesus Christ prayed. He spent some time, a whole night in prayer. He didn't ask people to pray for him, but he is our mediator. He is our high priest, and he spent time, time in prayer. We pray privately, but we should never pray in a private spirit. What do I mean? We don't pray just for ourselves but we pray also for others. All our public prayers are addressed to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. All our public prayers. That's the pattern we find in the Word of God. But now, in your private prayers, you can straight address straight the Lord Jesus Christ because actually one, once you speak to one of the persons of the Godhead, it's like you are speaking to the three persons. When you say, Lord Jesus Christ, you are also addressing the Father. You are addressing the Holy Spirit. Though we do not find anyone addressing directly the Holy Spirit, all our prayers must be by the power of the Holy Spirit. We do not start our prayers, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, as some, some churches do, but all our prayers are to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, before I give some, uh, some uh, aspect, hindrances we face in prayer, please, when you pray, uh, or when I pray, who comes to our mind? Just me? Myself? The, the great I? Never praying for others? Our church support more than 25 missionar missionaries around the globe. Oh, Maybe you cannot pray for each one of them every day, but you may have, you may dispatch your list. You may d diversify your prayers. And one week I pray for this, another week for this, another week for another one in Nepal, in India, in Ghana, in Nigeria, in Mali, and so on, in Colombia, in Bolivia, in uh, uh, Slovakia, in, in Bulgaria, in Hungary, and so on. So we can diversify our list of prayers, the, 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 the activities, the ministry of the church, the outreach, the pastors, the elders, the deacons. So there is so much. Actually, if you really have a list of prayer, you will see five minutes, ten minutes will not do it. And that's why we can concentrate and have that list, and it will help us to know what to pray for and whom to pray for. And I'm sure this is practical in our Christian life. Now, there are hindrances uh, uh, about prayer, things which are pitfalls and stumbling block when we start to pray. And I wouldn't dare to explain any of them, but if you want just to note the list, I'm sure that will help you. What makes our prayers not to be heard from above? What stops our prayers not to pass, not to go anywhere? And this is why we struggle, we pray, we pray, but there is no answer. What for? Oh, the first pitfall, the first stumbling block, of course, is sin. Sin is heinous, sin is hideous. Do you want to know how sin is ugly? Oh, I'm sure you know. How much did it cost? It cost the only begotten Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the price which cost sin. And on that cross, Christ became sin for us if we trust in him. So sin is uh, 
dangerous and sin. If I have hidden sin in my life, the Lord will never hear me. Psalm 51 again, Psalm 37. There are so many Psalms where we could see sin must be confessed. If we confess our sins, God is righteous and, and faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us from every iniquity. 1 John 1, 9. Proverbs 28, verse 13. He who hides his sin shall not prosper, but he who confesses them and forsake them we must add that part, and forsake them, shall receive mercy. Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2 says that God is not deaf, his hand is not too short, but our sins is what makes the world, oh sin, resist the devil, obliterate, if it's possible, put a spiritual bleach on it in order for your prayers to be able to take wings and to reach God in the heavenly places. Oh, second, second stumbling block or second hindrance, doubts. James chapter one, somebody asking God and still doubt about, he is wavering. Actually, the, the Greek text says, he's a person with two hearts. He wants something and he wants the opposite, but you cannot love one thing and love the opposite, opposite at the same time. So insincerity, doubts will hinder our prayers before the Lord. I said I will not comment, but it's so hard just, just to, to, to give a, a glance on these aspects. So the list continues. Wrong motives. Wrong motives. And this is why James could say, we do not receive because we ask amiss that we may consume it at our lusts. We ask for wrong motives. And God said he will not answer. And the fourth, the fourth hindrance is pride. Pride. God resists the proud. A proud heart, God will resist it. But he gives grace to whom? To the humble spirit. A humble spirit, God will not reject. He will receive a humble spirit. The fifth one, unbelief, idolatry, worldliness. A heart that is not separated from the world. A covetous heart will not receive from the Lord. The sixth one, unforgiving heart. In our second study, we will, we will speak about forgiveness because Paul, in his, uh, in his descriptions of the marks of a Christian, he speaks about refreshing the hearts of believers. An unforgiving spirit, stony heart, never, I cannot forgive him. Oh, have you been forgiven then? That's the big question we must ask ourselves. Unforgiven, bitter heart and bitter spirit. The seventh one, which is not often listed, but I think it is important. An unhonoring husband. A husband that does not honor his wife. First Peter chapter 3, verse 7, his prayers will be hindered. Oh, the husband should honor his wife. The wife also, Ephesians chapter 5, should honor her husband. It's vice versa. It is a, a mutual reciprocity in, in the life of, a, of the couple. But remember, husband, you do not honor your wife. You, you, you slander her. You make jokes of her. God said he will not answer. He will not answer our prayers. And the eighth one, lack of perseverance. Luke chapter 18, impatience. And you will agree with me, we live in a world where people want everything now and right now. But the Lord Jesus Christ said, be patient. And patience is a virtue. You remember what, uh, what Spurgeon said. Again, I, I said it many times. But through uh, patience or perseverance, sl snail, the snail was able to get into the ark. So be patient. God is patient. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm impatient most of the time, but God is patient. He has his time. I wait upon his time. And certainly, God will answer. Wait is an answer. No is an answer. Yes is an answer. But also, 
disobedience to the word of God. Somebody who is disobeying the Lord, he's disobeying his word, he, he takes things, or oh, my opinions, what I think, my imagination, never, never obeying to the word of God until, or oh, he may say, thousands and thousands of prayers the Lord will not hear. So these are few hindrances which will hinder and which will block and stop our prayers before God and God will not answer. What are the marks of a Christian? He has received grace. He has received peace. He is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He knows Christ as Lord and Savior. And now he is a brother. He is a, she is a sister. And he is a beloved, not a slave, but more than that. He is a servant of righteousness, a slave of righteousness, not slave, not slave of his own whims, of his own desires, of his own lust, of his own covetousness, and so on. But now he wants to do good. The Christian wants to do good. And this is our calling before, before God. And a Christian is somebody who prays, who intercedes for others. Now I have time to do a third one on the dozen, a third one. A Christian is somebody thankful. He is thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. A Christian, somebody grateful. Have you met an ungrateful person? I'm sure even you and me, human being, we hate somebody ungrateful. And to our children, I'm sure you don't need even to, to, to our children, but you give something to somebody, Come, come. You, see, you didn't say something. Something is missing. The little word, the little precious word, the little golden word, thank you. If there is nothing in your life every day, actually, I may exaggerate by saying, if there is nothing to thank God every hour in your life, then uh, you are in trouble. You start to be amnesic. You are starting to lose your, your mind. Make sure every day, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, give thanks to the Lord. This is the will of God for us. And I believe, as I read many Psalms throughout the Bible, throughout the New Testament, thanksgiving is the most repeated command in the Bible. You can check in Psalm 100. It's a, a thanksgiving psalm, so many others. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 20. Give thanks to God in all things, not just in good things. And remember, Romans 8, 28, all things work for good. All things, not only the good things. Some people, they, they inject the word, the all good things. No, the text doesn't say all good things. All things, the good, the bad. The, the hard circumstances. And actually, James could say, James chapter 1, verse 2, count it all joy. But again, I do not want to be misunderstood. Joy doesn't mean to have a smile. That's not the, that's, it's an inner peace, an inner joy the Lord Jesus Christ gave. So a Christian, the third mark, a Christian is a thanksgiving person. And it's interesting, all Paul's letters except one, Galatians, we know why. All of his 13 letters save Galatians in his introductory words, in his introduction, in the greetings, he always gives thanks. My brothers and sisters, I'm closing. Prayer and thanksgiving are always attached. They are inseparable. You pray to the Lord, you thank the Lord, and you are grateful to the Lord. Thanksgiving is a constant element in the Christian life. Oh, be thankful that your name, you know what is your name? Christian. In 1 Peter 4, verse 16, it is a badge of honor. Uh, the country I come from, when you say you are a Christian, who? Oh, Christian? A dog, an infidel, unclean, to be persecuted. But I read the New Testament, I read the Bible. That's the greatest honor you can receive in this world and in the world to come. So 
never be ashamed of the word being called a Christian and be thankful because you are a Christian. Be thankful to the Lord. Be thankful for one another. Be thankful for good health. Be thankful even in sickness. Be thankful in the way the Lord provides for you and me. Oh, I, I, I heard a sister from the church told me about a man. He's so sick in his bed that somebody has to lift him to turn his body. And when, when I think I'm, I'm, I'm complete, I'm whole, and I still complain, I still grumble, just the smallest headache, oh my, it's the end of the world. Christians, brothers and sisters, be thankful. Be thankful to the Lord. And finally, be thankful that other people went to places that I do not have to go. <laughs> Hudson Taylor went to China. I don't need to go there. William Carey went to India. <laughs> if you think it's easy to learn another language, just give a try. <laughs> David Livingstone to Africa. Oh, I thank God. Those men went there and they have sown the seed. Papua New Guinea, and so I don't need to go there, new, learn a new culture, new language, new food, and so on. I thank God for everything. Be thankful to the Lord. I conclude by saying again, a Christian has received grace and peace with God. A Christian is a man of prayer. He's an intercessor. And a Christian is a thankful person.